hundred years ago, Americans fought a revolution. A revolution against big government. And has sent hither swarms of officials to harass our people and eat out their substance. George III and his bureaucrats taxed and controlled their lives until the people said, enough. Today, the government in Washington, D.C. makes you nostalgic for old King George. The royal tax collectors took about 25% from our ancestors. This year, government at all levels will extract 50% of our money to waste. And not gently. IRS agents use wiretaps, mail openings, informants, disguises, guns, chains, and jails to get every last dime. Come on in, William. Let me show you around. Come on in, William. What do you got here, Harry Crouch? Well, this is the home of the San Diego Men's Center. Uh, we're, our center is um, totally self-sufficient. Uh, we have no revenue from the state, the county, local, or federal government. And we have no VAWA dollars. Matter of fact, in the state of California, by state law, um, men are not entitled to receive funds for domestic violence programs by state law. It's, for, it's forbidden. That sounds gender biased, uh, Harry. What is this sign here? These signs are done by one of our activists. His name is Ray Bloomhurst up in Los Angeles County. Our primary organization is the National Coalition of Free Men Los Angeles. And he makes these signs. And we offer these things at cafeshops.com men's biz. So for advocates who want to uh, have advocacy products. That's a very unique poster. Well, this is pretty critical. Um, these are from National Crime Statistics <clears throat> and are thought to be an understatement, obviously, because men underreport. That's pretty common knowledge. Aside from which, the same study said 1.435 million women are abused every year, but 250,000 are rape victims. No male rape victims are in this, those numbers, so you have to kind of factor that out because uh, male rape victims in prison weren't counted, and many states, over the years, their definition of rape simply was not suitable to include men, was not suitable to include men, was not suitable to include men, was not suitable to include men. So no data was collected. So the numbers offered by the federal government are... Skewed. Well, skewed is not the word. Well, skewed, I guess that's exactly what they are. But they don't tell you that. You have to figure that out on your own. Well, let's see your facility here, Harry. Come on in. Well, this is my kind of my control center. This is where I put me every day. And I work on various things. I do individual advocacy. So clients come in. Uh, we don't charge them anything. They're welcome to leave a donation. Uh, but I'll help them go to court on certain issues, restraining orders, false accusations. Uh, we do paternity fraud testing here, so we work with paternity fraud victims, a lot of those. I just had a case yesterday, a young man called me up, and the mother of his child sold the child to an adoption agency without telling him. And so now he's trying to figure out how to get involved with the system so he can at least make a case for having his own child. That's an uphill wow. battle. So The mother sold the father's child without even telling him. Sure, happens all the time. Happens all the time? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Women have the right, to, with respect, men have no rights when it comes to choice. Women have all their rights when it comes to choice. What do the Democrats and Republicans basically do for men? Nothing. Uh, and it's really interesting. I mean, the Democrats, we can all understand the reason why that happens, because the Democratic Party is basically been taken over by radical feminists. And we still have an awful lot of traditional family values where the men of the family identify strangely enough with the radical feminists when they make arguments about motherhood and children and things like that. So basically what you have is two competing ideologies for totally different reasons driving for the same end when it comes to issues of parenting. Now where are some of your products you have for men that want to protest somehow with a t-shirt? Here's one of our shirts. This is Shame on the Domestic Violence Movement for Lying. Wow. Uh, this uh, Ray Bloomhurst did for a protest we had down here a few months ago, and everybody was wearing this shirt. Parental alienation, paternity fraud, the false accusations 
are all by definition forms of domestic violence. Courts will not prosecute any woman and sanction them in any meaningful way for committing any of those three crimes. They won't do it. Well, thank you, Harry Crouch of the San Diego Men's Center, fighting to stop the legal abuse by CPS, the whole foster agency, the foster parenting agency, the criminals of the family court, a one-man demolition team to stop the abuse of parents who have a natural right to their own children. And today is Thursday, and just today, a young couple who have a child stolen are with us in the studio, and just today they were in court when they were supposed to have, if they had gone along with their attorneys, their parental rights terminated. Welcome, Jason and Cassidy. Welcome to the show. It's good Thank to be you. here. You said earlier you weren't nervous today like you were prior days. Is that right, Cassidy? Correct. You went in there with with attorneys that you had already fired, and they came in and tried to do what? Tried to terminate parental rights, take away my son. But you had already given them a notice that they're fired, didn't you? Yes. And they still tried to help the court terminate your... And these are the attorneys that are supposed to be helping you, is that right? Yeah. Jason, how did you feel about having your attorney who's supposed to help you get your child, try to help the court terminate your parental rights. How did that feel? It felt horrible. It felt like being stepped on, like um, helpless. But um, luckily we were able to uh, get things going in our favor by getting it, rid of them. You got rid of them because you had already given them what the prior day or two? MC050. You terminated their contract with you? Yes. You got rid of your attorneys? Yes. And this was the best day you've had in court so far, isn't it? Most progress, yes. You had to fire the attorneys appointed by the court. Do you now get the feeling those attorneys were appointed specifically to st help them steal your child? Yes, definitely. definitely. So what would you recommend anybody who's had their child kidnapped by CPS without a warrant, without a jury verdict, what would you recommend when they say, oh, the court's going to appoint me an attorney? Deny it. Do not... Uh, do not comply with Yeah, any... do not go under contract with them. Yeah, so this is all a kangaroo court, isn't it? Yes. yes. And today you had, you had two people try to go into court there with you, and you guys had prepared your own documents, and you sued who? Who did you name in that document? The judge. The judge. judge. You sued the judge who's sitting on your case, yeah. Judge Herman. Mm -hmm. He was kind of... How would you describe him, Cassidy? I think he was shocked. He's, he wasn't happy about yeah, it. Yeah, not happy. Gee, I don't think anybody's happy to get sued and find themselves a defendant, are they? No. But what do you feel about this judge and both you each had a different attorney? This is your child. You're married now. Yes. And this is your child they took from you six months ago. Do you feel like all the attorneys, the judges, the whole cabal were a bunch of criminals just trying to rob you of your child? Yeah. yeah. They're all in bed together. Good, good phrasing, all in bed together. Good phrasing, Jason. So you'd recommend people don't accept an appointed attorney? I recommend that. Would you recommend they demand a jury trial? Yes. Oh, yes. That's the only and, fair way. What was the first words you said in the court today, Cass, when you, you were appearing by? By Sui Juris. Uh-huh. I said, I, Cassidy McIntyre, Cassidy McIntyre, Sui Juris by special appearance and... We asked if, um, if it was a court that was um, that upheld... Constitutional due process? Correct. Yes. And the judge's eyes twitched when you said that, didn't they? Mm -hmm. I wasn't even in the court. How do I know his eyes twitched? He's not expecting little old us to know this stuff. Yeah, you're just... You're how old, Jason? 20? 27. You're 27 year old, Cassidy. 24. He didn't expect a young couple in their 20s to refuse him jurisdiction because that's what you were doing. You said, I'm here by special appearance mm -hmm. until informed this is a court of constitutional law. You said something like that? Mm -hmm. Yes. And he was like, uh. <laughs> You're not contracting with our kangaroo court anymore. 
well, we can't go ahead and terminate your parental rights. And you're suing me, which means I got to take myself off the case. He pretty much told us if we, we shot ourselves in the foot and if we, we still had a chance to fix all of this, if we went back to our attorneys and did everything they wanted us to do so they could make their money. and So they can make their money. I think yeah. you said it right, Cassie. So they can make the money. Meanwhile, now that they've kidnapped your child for what, six months, five months? Seven. Going on eight. Going on eight. Going on eight months. These criminals, Judge Herman, who is an unindicted criminal, these attorneys that cooperated were trying to get you to the point. And at one point, one of them took you aside. You had two different attorneys, and Correct. one of them, whose attorney was that? When Lawrence K. Scott. Lawrence K. Scott took you aside with him, who mm -hmm. had his own attorney. Yes. And you weren't married at that point. No. And he tried to do what with you guys in that little room? He, we were supposed to go on trial, and he recommended and said, if you do this, you're just going to make the judge mad. And he coerced us into waiving our rights to a trial. He coerced you into yes. waiving your rights to a trial by jury under due yes. process of the Constitution. Is that what you think your attorney is supposed to do for you? Oh, no. no. But Lawrence K. Scott did that. That's what he did. Are you going to sue Lawrence K. Scott? For everything he's worth. For everything he's worth? Yes. Because he rolled you farther down the road to where today they were going to terminate your parental rights taking his advice, weren't they? Mm -hmm. And we can get a spouse for aiding and abetting. And you're going to sue his spouse, right. too, for yes. aiding and abetting him? This is going to be interesting. I don't think they're going to be happy campers. I hope not. We've been pretty unhappy for the last eight months. Yeah, they've made you, they kidnapped your child. Did anybody give you a warrant and say, we have a warrant signed by a judge as a jury verdict that no. you're unfit parents? No warrant was served. It was a piece Did you ever have a jury trial? No. No. They just came in and grabbed your child. What would you think if, if uh, these same uh, hoods, uh, I got to call them scumbag CPS workers, mm -hmm. if they kidnapped your, your vehicle and said, now you've got to take driver education and go through all the programs to treat your car really nice, keep the tires inflated, and maybe we'll give you your car rights back to you. If I, wouldn't that sound ridiculous? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that's what they've done with your child. Into the picture comes a gal named Julie Witherspoon. We'll interview her shortly. Did she have an influence on you? Very big influence. Yes. We wouldn't be where we are now without You would have her. probably had your parental rights terminated today. Yes. yes, today. And then they would have been demanding you pay what, Jason? Um, child support. They want to kidnap your child, and then they want to make you pay child support yeah. for it. Is this insanity or is this Russia? <laughs> Are we in the, Soviet, the old Soviet Union? It's where so the government owns your children? Very corrupt. But you're fighting back. Oh, yes. Are you going to help other couples fight back? Yes. Are you going to bump into other people and going through the same process and say, wait a minute? Yes. Hmm. Just like Julie helped us. Did you ever hear of a woman named Betty Powers? Um, I've heard you talk about her. But you never saw her on my show. No. You weren't interested because you didn't have a child then. That was like two, three years ago. But now it means a lot to you, doesn't it? Yes. This whole subject matter of due process. Mm -hmm. The right for a jury to say, oh, you took a Vicodin. Well, we better take your child away from you. Do you think a jury will do that? No. no. I don't think so either. Especially not if I'm on the jury. <laughs> so you can be sure they won't call me. <laughs> well, thank you for coming in. Is there anything else you want to tell us? Did you feel good today? Yeah. I at first I didn't quite know what and how to feel, but after processing and or seeing how our attorneys and the judge reacted when we dropped words like sui juris and the talking about our amendments and rights, they just shifted in their seats and they started to squirm. Oh, yeah. yeah. They were uncomfortable. And you had your mother with you, right? I, I asked if she could be in the room, and they said no. Nope. Get out. 
everyone on the other side. Got to stay. Yes. yes. And they had a what, five or eight people? Mm -hmm. At least. Including the foster parents that are. And they all get to be in there. Yeah. But nobody from your side can be in there. Does that mm -hmm. seem like due process to you? Not at all. So you want to move this into a court of due process. That's what you're attempting to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. And go after these people. Are you going to sue Herman? Oh, Judge yeah. Herman? Oh, yeah. He's named in that document, isn't he? Yes. yes. Did you know his wife is also, I think yes. his wife is also an attorney, uh, judge. Oh, wow. So they're knocking down close to 400000 a year. Hmm. So they got deep pockets for you to go after. Good. They're going to need them, aren't they? Yes, they are. Because you're going to learn the law. You're not going to depend on attorneys anymore, are you? No. The attorneys did nothing but what? Hurt us. Oh, Very much. Us so, sold you out. You could have had your child back. Six, seven months ago. Yeah. But yeah. you kept jumping through the little hoops, mm -hmm. right? We yep. have a lot of cleaning up to do because of them. In When you were in that courtroom today, did you see a flag like this with a gold fringe on it? Yes. yes. Do people, exactly. do you know what this gold fringe means? Um, I heard you say it's a, a naval flag. It's an admiralty flag, admiralty flag and it's a flag of a conquered people. It's basically saying, you're slaves, we have conquered you. You have no rights. That's what that flag with the gold fringe. Some people think it's a fancy dressed up American flag. That's not what this is. This is a flag of a conquered people. They have them in the city hall. They have them in the county supervisor's buildings. They have them everywhere because actually we are a conquered people and people just don't know it. If they were flying the true American flag, the U.S. federal code tells you exactly the size and describes three colors, red, white, and blue. There's no mention of a gold fringe on the American flag. This is a flag of a conquered people. And they were treating you like what? Conquered people. And you finally woke up and you came out of the matrix. Yes. Kind of a shock, huh? Yes. You thought all oh, these people were going to help you and all oh, they're going to help you. Yeah. And if you just jump through the hoops, they're going to help you. And you jumped and jumped and jumped over a Vicodin because you were having that child. Yes. Doctors give them stronger drugs than Vicodin when you have a child, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yes. There's probably, I mean, CPS workers going home, having a beer and... Marijuana and oh, shot yeah. cocaine. And yeah. They wanted your blood tests when you had that baby, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. Have you demanded that they give a blood test? That the judge, Herman, give a blood test and know that he's sober and clean of drugs when he's on the bench? Mm -hmm. Have you demanded that the CPS worker that took your child submit a drug test? Mm -hmm. Why not? I mean, if we're all supposed to be equal, why yeah. can't you demand they submit to a drug test daily every day they come to work? I agree. They put a lot of fear in people. And Are you past fear now? Yes. Pretty much, yes. I don't, I just see them as... I, not even equal. I see them lower than us because who can do what they do? How can they sleep at night? Well, obviously, because they're rich, so. They're rich. Mm -hmm. And they make money mm -hmm. from kidnapping unwary young parents just like you. And selling them. And selling them. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Jason. They sell and... You're not going to get much help from the state legislature, are you? Because they balance the state budget. With uh, the funds they get. From the federal government. They're all in the same. And that doesn't come to help your child or pay child support. That just stays in the state budget. Hmm. Does that explain why you can call your assemblymen and senators to hell freezes and they don't care, they aren't listening to you? It's horrible. I want to thank you for coming in and I hope we'll see you again. Definitely. Good luck in yes. your lawsuit against Lawrence Scott. And who's the other attorney you're going to sue? Uh, Darlin Baldwin. You think you're going to Sarah Baldwin? Yeah, I think she, that's a woman, isn't it? It is. Yes. I think she's the one that tricked Betty Powers into waiving her rights to a jury trial. And after that, that was it, it was all downhill. In fact, Darlin, today she asked Judge Herman if we could finish the hearing today and he... <laughs> Yeah, she. She was trying to that. push ahead to terminate yeah. your parental rights. She yes. wanted to zip it up really quick. Think, Do you think she knows she's now liable to lose her license? I think to she be does. sued. That's why she wanted everything to be done. She's scared.
Well, good luck to you. And now, people, the lady who's really been ripped through the shredder, her name's Julie Witherspoon. We're going to go to a tape of when Julie, who, according to Julie, had been multiply raped by her high school band teacher. And she's here with us in the studio today. This is her wedding video. Let you watch that guy you think that is her dad. That's not her dad. That's the band teacher she's marrying. His name is Danny Witherspoon. We'll go to that tape and we'll be back with Julie Witherspoon here live in the studio. Well, I woke up this morning. This arrangement does seem to meet our deepest human needs for loving companionship, for someone with whom we can share in an intimate, trusting way all of the hopes and joys and the dreams of life. It is in marriage that we develop our best virtues. We learn to be more kind and thoughtful and more unselfish. It is also here that we share life's sweetest and learn life's finest lessons. I know that you both will agree that now the marriage of our lives most solemn. For here you are assuming the lifelong responsibility of meeting each other's needs and desires, trusting all of your hopes for happiness and fulfillment and meaning into each other's hands. There is one basic rule without which marriage cannot possibly succeed. And that rule is, from this moment forth, you must never allow anyone or anything to become more important to you than the love and loyalty which you are here declaring. If you will, always give each other the very first place in your affections and your loyalties then your marriage will withstand any pressures or problems of life. Danny, do you take Julie to be your lawful wife? Do you? Julie, do you take Danny to be your lawful husband? I do. I ask now for the tokens of your sincerity and the keeping of these vows. Will you please take the bride's bouquet? Now the rings which you have chosen 
are symbols of the love which you share. They set you apart from everyone else. They are silent witnesses to the world that you do belong together. Danny, as you place the ring on her finger, be sweet people. Julie, with this ring, Julie, with this ring. I marry you. All that I am and have, All that I, am and have. I, give to you. I give to you. Julie, as you place the ring on Danny's finger, please repeat. Danny, with this ring, Danny, with this ring, I marry you. I marry you. I accept your promise of love. I accept your promise of love. And in return, I give. And in return, I give a wife's best love. A wife's best love. Will you both please step forward? Danny, please place your left hand on the certificate. And your left hand on his Julie. As you wear these rings through all of the years with which God may bless your marriage, may the rings themselves always be a blessing to you in this way. Each time that you look upon the rings, let it remind you of the promises of love which you have made and received here. Also, may the sight of the ring be an encouragement to you to live a life that is so filled with beauty Red wine. that each other will strive to fulfill these promises of love. Again, may God bless you. May he give you a home and fill it with peace and fill every day with happiness. And now I pronounce you husband and wife. And you may kiss your bride, sir. <laughs>
Well, it was like at the end of my freshman year, and it was becoming the summertime for summer band camp. So it was around, it was at the end of my freshman year, and then all through my sophomore year, yes. So you were like 16 or 15 when he started having sex with you? 15. 15? Yes. Did anybody say to you, Julie, are you doing something funny with that Danny Witherspoon, the band director? All my friends wanted to vomit. They did? Yes. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Looking back, do you mm. understand why your friends felt that way? Oh, yeah, he's just putrid. I was nice looking and hot. and You were beautiful. Oh, yes. Now you're a wounded warrior. You had two children by him. And when I say wounded warrior, I don't mean just from the marital battle to get your children back. I've walked through the gates of hell. And you've been to what, Iraq? Yes, I have. You got wounded in Iraq, injured? Yes. And you had to have some reconstructive surgery on your jaw? Yeah, you don't have to smile. That's that's enough. Thank you. So you're a, a wounded, injured veteran. You just re-upped for six years to get the money, you said, to pay your attorney, Pat Berry? Yes. Because your did. first attorney, Steve Gardner, brought the wrong argument in the wrong court. Right. It, the Hague petition was supposed to be argued in federal court, and he argued it in that little crony ki kitty court, kangaroo court. In the kangaroo court where... It's a contract, not a, not under contract due law. That's right. what they operate off of the WIC code section three hundred. All contract law, not due process under the Constitution. Absolutely not. In fact, they have no authority unless you give it to them. Did you just notice what this young couple Cassidy and Jason just did? They, yes, my heart goes out to them. They've been screwed out of their child since it was, I think, two or three years old, two or three days old. Well, the first day uh, the baby was born, to my understanding, they... This is, is this just government kidnapping? This is kidnapping under color of law, and it needs to be stopped. Do we need to put these judges in jails? They need to be in jail, the social workers, anybody who takes part, aids, abeds, or assists them, and does not do what is right, what the, uh, their oath says, because they all have to take an oath, and they're in complete violation of it. I want sanctions on all of them. And the CPS workers, they should go to jail too because a lot of them lie. That's without, what I said. Yeah, they, they lie in court, don't they? Yeah, they fabricate false, fictitious uh, reports to keep the child um, in the system to collect Title IV D on the child. Wow. Most people who haven't had these problems don't know what Title IV D is. Can you briefly, very briefly tell them what it is? Well, when the state... Uh, kidnaps your child under false pretenses most of the time. Um, they have Title IV D. It's even when you pay child support, the state matches the funds like seven ways a Sunday. So they get money from the federal government. They you get mean money the federal from government matches the county. The yeah, the county, the state. Um, so it trickles down to the county, and all these people get a chunk of your. Yeah, and plus grant money too. They get the they get grant money. They get donations from corporations like Target and. Uh, the Dave Thomas Foundation from Wendy's, they support CPS just as well. So when you ever shop at those places, think twice. You don't buy at Wendy's Burgers? Or Target. They or Target. donate uh, lots of money to social services. Wow. Well, you changed my mind. I'm not eating at Wendy's anymore, and I'm not going to buy at Target. I've seen the damage it did to you. Uh, I mean, when I look at that wedding tape, you were... Just barely 17 there, right? Yes, I was. Three months pregnant. Right. He had been doing you for almost two years while he was getting paid to teach you drum rolls. That is correct. But he was rolling you over in the clover. Pretty much. Pretty much, huh? Yeah. And your father was not really in your life. Your father was a Russian immigrant. Yes. And, your, and he and your mother had a one-night stand. Well, uh, actually, my um, my biological father it was raised as my brother, and my um, uh, my father, who is legally my father, is passed away. He was a Russian immigrant. Okay, so the the guy that's still alive, who is your biological dad? Yes. He never really was dad to you. He wasn't around to say, "Hey, Julie, you don't date your band teacher." Oh, not at all. He was like totally out of the picture. Your mother was totally out of the picture. She was deaf. Deaf. A mute. Uh, no, she was just deaf and deaf. 
um, living somewhere in Las Vegas or Needles. And very beautiful. Yes, very beautiful. But chasing a modeling life. She was a model. But she didn't want to parent you. Absolutely not. So your grandparents basically were Adopted your parents. Adopted me. And your, your grandfather was your dad, but he died when you were, what, seven? That's correct. Then you were dumped in this horrible place called, at the orphanage called what? Oh, I was in I was in the system. I was in McLaren Hall back in 1980-81. Um, that was because my biological mother's father was a, a police officer at the time um, on his way to becoming a judge later on. Oh, on the way to becoming a judge. Yes. Gee, how the circles go around, huh? Go ahead. So um, she wanted to cause trouble for my biological father, so... Um, uh, her family having the the power, the money, the authority, they uh, issued a pickup for me and threw me in a horrible children's home called McLaren Hall in uh, South El Monte, California. And it gave you the willies when we drove by there, didn't it? Uh, I will never forget that horror. You were peed on by other kids yes, in there. I sure was. Mostly black kids? Yes, and I was uh, actually scared of black people for a long time after that because... Um, you were like six or seven? They were, they were no, I was younger than that. I was five. Five, and they're abusing you, and the people running it don't stop these other kids from peeing well, on you? the people running the place would actually beat me in the back of the head with a hairbrush, so I was abused in that place. It was horrible. Were these Catholic nuns? No, they weren't. What, was it a Catholic institution? Just county, county Just state county. employees, yes. So the foster system didn't treat you very well, and you grew up like a wild thing with no real dad around. Your dad was gone. Your adoptive dad was dead. Well, he, he, he passed away when I was seven. So, seven. So your know. grandmother thought this was maybe a good thing. You're marrying a band teacher, and you're taken care of. Well, um, he stole her heart because he is college educated and he was a mason just like her father was and he's a good old boy. Oh, so, so the masons are in on this. The, the masons are in. I got to take my hat off to you, Julie. So the masons were covering up for all the bad stuff going in here. That is correct. Do you think most masons would be happy to know this? I think it would put shame to their little club, but um, that this... After studying what they do in their ceremonies, they kind of promote this kind of behavior of child molestation and sick rituals and, you know, all this behavior he's out running around doing. Well, I don't, I don't know if the Masons promote it, but is it possible there's some derelict cells? Like, you identified that one place, and I went and looked it up. It was listed as a Masonic lodge, and it wasn't. It was that one lawyer's private home. Right, well, his lawyer... Backed up his, to a golf course. His dirty attorney, Robert Scott, is also uh, a mason, but not a high degree like my uh, ex-husband. My ex-husband is a 33rd degree, which is a past master. Danny Witherspoon? is a 33rd degree mason. And he's the guy that raped you while you were in high school? That is him. And he's still an honored mason, is that right? Oh, the best. He can walk on water, according to the general public. He works He's a 32nd degree Mason? 33rd. 33rd degree. The highest. The yes. highest. Mm -hmm. And you were his fifth wife? Fourth or fifth. I've never really straightened that out because he's fourth never been honest with me. <laughs> fourth, or f fourth or fifth. Can't I'm one of going. those numbers. <laughs> and you had contact by one of his other wives who literally ran away from him and the Masonics and went to a different state, yes. far from California. And she wants nothing to do. She did appear in court, though, didn't she? By telephone, yes, by she telephone. did. By telephone. She made an appearance on your behalf. That was the wife before me. The wife before you. Yeah, Yvonne Witherspoon. How could the Mason sanction a guy being a 33-degree Mason and having sex with a 15, 16-year-old teenager in the school where he's teaching her. How, how, maybe Clive has an answer. Clive, you got well, an answer about that? We probably do. What's By the way, welcome crazy. Clive Boustron. It's wonderful to be on your show again, William. You've Good been sitting you. here so patiently. I want to do your thing separately, but you got a comment on the Masons. Oh, well, it's intriguing. Um, I, I've been subject to extraordinary abuse in this country, and we'll get onto some of that stuff. I've literally been shot at in front of my kids. In fact, the Santa Cruz Sheriff shot at me from a range of five to seven feet, literally tried to blow my head off in front of my children. That was six years ago. By the grace of God, they missed and hit By the car grace door. of God only am I here today. When that happens, when someone starts shooting at you, 
and you get thrown in jail under false charges. I said I wouldn't cut my hair till I got justice, by the way. That's why it's getting so long. <laughs> You're not getting justice, Clyde. I'm not getting justice, no. But when someone does shoot at you like that, you start studying. And I've studied this intensively. We can go back to the mid-1800s, mid-1850 mid round there. That was when the Masons turned face. Because you remember, most of the Masons actually founded this nation. If you George look at Washington the founding was fathers, a Mason. Indeed. And they were good people. They were good people back in the Now, in America, America was part of the Reformation. The new rena there was a renaissance. This was what America was doing. It was changing the world. And the Nuvus Ordo Seculum that you see on the seal, the great seal of America, that triangle, that pyramid, meant new order of the ages. Nothing to do with the new world order, by the way. We'll get on to that but new order of the ages. And this new order of the ages in America was that we the people were sovereign. No one was sovereign over us. What had happened way back in Germany was that Gutenberg invented the printing press. Then Martin Luther, for example, translated the Bible from Latin into German and then later it was translated into English. And the regular folk could pick up the Bible and they could read it. And all of a sudden they realized that the Pope was not God. And the word of the Pope was not God. And that they had a direct path to God. Not through any preacher. They, they didn't have to pay for forgiveness of sins. So this Renaissance, this Reformation, this whole foundation of America, which was built by Masons, incidentally, was built on this Nuvus Ordo Seculum, the new order of the ages, where we the people were sovereign. And the Pope lost power. In the mid-1500s, around 1540, this was getting so, such a troublesome area for the Catholic Church that they formed the Catholic Mafia, known as the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits. Ignatius Loyola formed that. Now, if you want to get an idea about the Society of Jesus, the best thing to do is to go to the Library of Congress and read the Oath of Office for the Society of Jesus, for the Jesuits. That's stored in our Library of Congress. It was actually registered in 1913. You can go to my website, Liberty for Life, and you click on the religion section. Liberty you know. for life. Is that F O R? Either. F O R or number four. Life.com. Liberty for life. And actually, if you click, if you want to get, learn a little bit about where we're talking about, click on the first article, the letter Israel must. And then in there, you'll see the letter about Albert Pike. And that's what brings us into America into the mid 1800s. Albert Pike, a Jesuit, became the head of the Masons. Now, Jesuits and Masons are diametrically opposed to each other. If you look at that oath of office that we have on file in the Library of Congress, it shows that they wanted to kill the Masons. One needs to ask, what was a Jesuit doing leading the Masons? Interesting question. Obviously, what the Jesuits' goal was, was to disrupt the United States of America, to destroy the Nuvus Ordo Seculum, to wipe out this Renaissance and this Reformation which was embodied in the United States of America. And that Mason, Albert Pike, overtook the Masonic groups and he turned them 180 degrees. He told them that their Lord was not Jesus. He told them that their Lord was Lucifer. If you read the book, Morals and Dogma, in fact, we have links, we have photographs of the book in there where Albert Pike refers to his God as Lucifer. At Liberty for Life. If you go to libertyforlife.com, click on the first article Whoa. on the top there. I, you know, I know there's some Masons out here. In fact, I have cousins who are Masons, and I'd, I had one of them ask me to become a Mason. Now, many of the Masons are good people. Now, the start, the fundamental principles of Masons and how they get people to join them on the lower levels are wonderful principles. They're taking care of your fellow men and women and people in trouble. They're good principles. They're not bad. But what you'll find with many of these secret societies, and unfortunately the Masons were formed as a secret society to get away from prosecution in Europe. But what happened in this Masonic group is they have these layers. And the one layer holds above the other layer and above the other layer, and you never know what's going on above you. So you get into the position where you have put through stuff, and it's a mafia methodology. The mafia will say, go and shoot that kid, or go and molest that child. Now they've got something on that person. And that's the methodology one will see which is embedded in these secret societies. Getting back to 1850s, that's when Albert Pike took over the Masons 
and he instigated as an adjutor the so-called civil war. He actually encouraged the taxation of the South. Now most of you went to school here in the United States of America. You know about the Boston Tea Party. Have you ever heard of the Merrill tax? No, no, I've never, never well, heard of Well, what did they tell you the reason for the uncivil war was? To finance both sides of the war by the bankers. Well, that's the underlying reason, absolutely. But the Merrill tax Julie's was exactly Julie's that. pretty sharp, isn't you've she? You've been educated, probably she because of what you've been put through. Once you get put through something like this, you start to study what's going on. And you need to go out there and study. And William, you're doing a tremendous job of bringing these issues to light. And what happened with respect to the Merrill tax was a 37% tax. Now, the Boston Tea Party was a 2% tax, which went up to a 5% tax. And they revolted over that. The Merrill tax was a 37% tax. Of course the South succeeded, was guaranteed. In the meantime, Albert Pike and his crew went and instigated it even further. They took bands of Native Americans up into the North to rape and pillage and to cause as much agitation as possible. And that war did exactly what you said. It caused a debt. If you want to study what's going on historically, study the philosopher Hegel. It's called a Hegelian dialect. Yeah. Conflict induces change. If we can cause a war, just like the pickpocket, run up and bump someone, during that moment of conflict, what the pickpocket does is they put their hand in your pocket and induce the change from your pocket into their pocket. And that's exactly what the bankers did. They caused that war, but Abraham Lincoln tried to do part of that. Incidentally, Abraham Lincoln was not honest in the least bit. You were taught that at state school, or sorry, state school. How can you not separate state and school? It's insanity. We talk about separation of church and state, which is a good idea. But for goodness sake, to let the state teach your kids? It's insanity, pure, utter insanity. You cannot let the state pump this religion of insanity into your kids because you won't know about the moral tax. And that gets us back to the Masons. We'll, get, get, we'll roll on onto that. The Masons basically were instigate, were inf in, in infiltrated by the Jesuits in the mid-1800s, causing the uncivil war. And that banker's debt, after they shot Lincoln for printing the greenbacks, lasted 70 years, and that gets you to 1913. But the Masons are not what they were found out to be in the original um, founders. They're exactly the opposite. The Masonic groups we have in the United States today practice some of the most heinous acts you can find They'll be involved in devil worship. They'll be involved in masochistic type operations. They will be involved in sodomy. They'll be involved in these horrific, horrific acts. And George it's Washington same. would be upset to know Paul. what has happened to the um, Masonic order, don't you? I think he'd be really... He'd, he, he, he'd be looking at that and say, for goodness sake, why, don't, why is there no integrity? Why is there no decency? Yeah, I think we know, for example, upset. Yale Bones Club, which is also associated with this, it goes back to Chapter 322 in Germany. Which yeah, which links spun up to off Hegel. the Nazi movement and also spun off, spun uh, off all, these things. all these things. But Albert Pike's most interesting because that letter he wrote to Mazzini, the head of the Mace, the, the, who was head of the Masons in Europe and also head of the Mafia in Europe in 1871, planned the First World War the Second World War, and this Third World War, and this great social economic cataclysm we're in right now. That was did, planned then. Did you know that, Julie? Well, I've, I've read most of what he's talking about. Did you know that this, this mafia leader in 1871 was planning World War I to happen? That these guys were manipulating World War I? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I've, I've read all about uh, the Pike guy he's talking about, and um, there's another one the Masons like is Hirama Biff. But, um, yeah, all these wars are staged. It, it makes money. Including the war you're just re-upped in for six years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you get to talk to any soldiers about any of this? Are they totally clueless? Or do they relate to you on any level when you try to explain any of this to them? Most of them are kids. They sit around playing video games and watching movies like Full Metal Jacket, and then they want to go out and be heroes. And when they actually hit the battlefield, it's not cracked up to what they thought it would be because, you know, it's not all fun and games no more. 
But uh, most of the uh, soldiers that I work with that do not have a combat patch on their right shoulder, you know, they, they're like, oh, I want to go over there, I want to go over there, uh, I want to I wanna kill some people, and they don't have no clue what they're talking about. They just watch the movies and play the video games. Wow. So we basically got educated fools wanting to rush in to a war that was created for them to die to make money for Gaki Corporation, Blackwater Corporation, Bechtel Corporation. What's the other one you saw over there? Oh, there's like Dynacorps. There's uh, K K KBR. KBR, that's mm -hmm. what I was thinking That's a big mm -hmm. one. Holly Burton is yeah. the mother company for yeah. that. Um, but but didn't, didn't Vice President Cheney have some financial interest in that corporation? I believe he's partnership in that. And yeah. he's also the same vice president that shot a lawyer in the face <laughs> and got a warning? He's also well, the I, vice president. Come on. I mean, if, if we could get more of our politicians to shoot lawyers. <laughs> well, you know, the, the other amazing... Yeah, we, uh, you might start a trend there. <laughs> shoot a lawyer in the face and you can be vice president too. The other amazing thing, William, is most 99.5% uh, of your... Uh, military personnel who raise their right hand and swear into the oath to protect this U.S. Constitution have not one clue of what it means or what it says in that, in that um, piece of paper. I believe you. I was just emailing some soldiers that are in Iraq just two weeks ago, and I would quote them parts of the Constitution. One of them said, well, we're in this war honestly. Our leader Bush brought us in here, and he has the right to do that to defend America. I said, what? What about but, Article know, 1? What know. about the Congress declaring war? What, they was, don't need that, he said. He back. We don't need that. The president can do it. I was drafted <laughs> for two years. In was, which army? The South African army? I was drafted army? in South African military. And incidentally, in South Africa, the constructs of apartheid have the same roots in Chapter 322 in Germany. The Hegelian dialect cause conflict. They want people to fight. The family court, the issues we're covering here, they want to encourage the divorce to be as acrimonious as possible so the lawyers, which stands for lots of attorney wages, can make lots of money. Yeah, well, that's And we're that's foolish clear. enough to get into these, these arguments and these debates. But as a draftee, as a young kid, I was drafted. It was meant to be the honorable thing. It's, it's put up there. It's marketed. It's a tremendous amount of marketing goes behind these wars. It's the honorable thing to go and serve your country. You talk to any Second World War veteran, They'll be full of honor and decency. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You see them all the time at the VA. However, <laughs> yeah, with arms and however, legs. however, what one Missing. does not understand is what they did not know when they were drafted into that war. Had they known that that war was planned in 1871 by Albert Pike and Mazzini, they might have a different perspective. And it's all about education. And one of the most exciting things we have today is this computer. Because the internet is the greatest printing press the world has ever seen. The internet is just like Gutenberg's printing press. It's allowing we the people to find out what's literally going on. And it's preventing the ability of the governments and the media to control what you see. What's classic though, and a question I would have for a, a veteran from Iraq, what did Iraq have to do with anything? I personally think we did horrible things over there. We were forced to do terrible things. Um, you know, I, m the, when I was in Iraq, I my job was to take, I was a heavy equipment transporter, and my job was to take the tankers to the front line and the Bradleys and any heavy oversized equipment. But the only thing I really saw a lot was the, the Holly Burton people just chilling, walking around in sandals, getting paid about 15 grand a month. Uh, now, the only concern that was ever really a 911 emergency over there is when an oil well was set on fire. That's when they really got concerned. But it wasn't about, um, you know, if you got your, blown, your ass blown to pieces in a convoy or, you know, this and that and the other. You know, Nobody the, cared much. We were working. The KBR people were chilling, uh, uh, making big bucks we were working for peanuts making nothing out in the hot sweat sun and yeah the only concern when the oil wheels set, set on fire did anyone sort of ask you know why iraq because when when the 9-11 i presume you've seen some of the 9-11 movies and if you haven't seen 9-11 movies you've well, got to go and see them like loose change i have i um, have and did they ask questions was they, they put saudi arabian faces i was one of the first terror. people over in iraq i deployed in 2003 yeah. so i was it was it was third ID from uh, Fort uh, 
been in Georgia, I think, 3rd ID from, yeah, Georgia, and I was in 1st Armor Division, so they hit the ground first, we hit the ground second. You know, there was nothing in Iraq, no Burger King, no shopping malls like they have now. Um, and before we were deploying, they kept saying, yeah, Saddam Hussein, they would call us the whole battalion meetings, he's hiding weapons of mass destruction, we got him on satellite, we seen him take him out in the trucks, we got to go stop him, he's got biological, chemical, uh, nuclear warfare, and we had to go over there and stop him. That was what they were rallying us up all about. Did you believe that at that time? At that time when they told you, did you believe that, Julie? Um, I always been rebellious, but then... Some then after it was riled up in my head a lot, I thought, oh God, maybe this is terrible. But at first, you know, I was just like, oh, it's just another s drill exercise, big deal. <laughs> hmm. You spent how many months in there, and you had two children that were in, staying in Germany. You had a housekeeper to take care of them. Yes. Right? You had left Danny Witherspoon. Yes. The man who's how many years older than you? Oh God, like he's like. 36 or 37 years older than me. You're now how old, 30? I'm 32. You're 32 now. Mm -hmm. So he's got to be 67? His birthday was 1842. So today he would be like yeah, 67. 67. Mm -hmm. I interviewed him. Did you know that? No, I didn't. I went to his high school. He's still teaching. I bet. In spite of what he did to you, in spite of that detective, what was his name? Uh, William Fetner. Instead of William Fetner trying to get him, he's back in California, the same jurisdiction he fled when he married you. And you did you understand when he married you that what he was really doing is wiping out the possibility he could be held for statutory rape? Um, did he, it, no, at the time. At the time, you know, I... I did kind of get wind of something because I, I know my, my mother, my grandmother who raised me, um, I think she threatened him because I, ha I did catch something at that, at that time, but I didn't she think She threatened that him? Like, you better marry her or you're going to jail or what? Yeah, I'll turn you in kind of oh. thing. Oh, so your grandmother was a little sharper. But it was done behind my back. I didn't and actually didn't hear that. You didn't know that. Right. And you so found that out later. I wanted to believe he really loved me and all that good stuff, but that and wasn't the case. you thought this was the cream de la cream. I've got a school teacher who loves me, and he wants to marry me, Julie yeah. Witherspoon. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> the gal who had no real dad around and no real mom around, and now I get the man teaching. You thought you'd hit the jackpot. Uh, yeah, I guess that made him and, nervous. <laughs> and we even identified one other schoolgirl. She was jealous of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was her name? Well, well, which one were you talking about? The one that's in that picture on the band role, and you guys are going, I think she's in the same oh, band. Oh, Allison role. McCauley. Uh, no, there was actually no jealousy. Uh, he was messing around with her, too. Oh, he was messing with her. Yeah, she had a lot of issues. Um, she had a, a, she's she's a basket, she was a basket case, had a lot of problems, too. Uh, tell me honestly, Julie, before you married Danny Witherspoon, your high school band instructor, yeah. before you married before him, didn't you get a little wind that he was also kissing up to other girls in the high school? I had heard the rumors, and I had a lot of kids called him a perv, like a lot of my classmates, and even some of the other teachers didn't think he was appropriate because of, for those reasons. Um, I just thought they were just, you know, picking on him because he was going through such a hard divorce at the time, and he was trying to do all he could for his band students, so some people put him down, and his ex-wife, of course, started rumors about him, too. And so you just thought Yvonne was starting ex-wife rumors. She's a bitter, divorced woman. Right. But then you had his baby. Mm -hmm. You're in Florida. Right. You had another baby. And then you find out he's maybe messing around at the school there with girls in Florida? Well, actually, I was... Or was it Ohio? I got pregnant in Florida. You got pregnant in Florida. Right. The second one. No, the first one. First one. Mm-hmm. Okay, then you came back and married in Las Vegas. Yes, but he was teaching you. I think he got you pregnant when you were teaching in. He was teaching in he, California. No, we were we were sexually involved, but uh, I wasn't actually uh, pregnant until he had uh, left the school. But we were sexually involved. So you could have gotten pregnant when you were fifteen or sixteen. Oh yeah, easy. 
easy. <laughs> so it was like a once a week affair or once? Oh, God, he used to come over to my house and, um, and sneak out. Uh, he would spend the night in my bedroom all night and sneak out about 3 o'clock in the morning because he was so paranoid. Like band students like Alan Ward and other PTA members were um, actually staking out my house. And, of course, we had the detective, William Fetner and his partner, so he used to be very cautious and come over and stay in the house, leave about 3 in the morning, go back to his little garage he had rented over on Ranchito Street in El Monte. And, um, yeah, he, then he got so paranoid to the point after the detectives started uh, coming over our houses, wanting to meet with me and my mother and calling us, tapping our phone lines. So my mother used to drive me out to like Palm Springs or way, way, way far away to meet him. To meet him? Yes. Your grandmother took you to motels to meet the guy that was raping you? Yes. Because she thought she was dying soon. And she did die pretty soon, didn't she? Oh, she died in 2001. Okay, this is 2009. Mm -hmm. That's eight years. So, but she was in bad health. I mean, as I watched her she walk in, in that health. wedding. She was bad health yeah, then. Yeah, she was terminally ill, diabetes, dialysis, all that good stuff. So she didn't know how long she had to go, and she thought, this guy better marry my girl, she Julie, really because... She really liked him. I think, I think you she know, was sort of she, like she would actually call him Valentine, which was my father's name. Oh. And I would actually get upset with her and say, don't you ever insult my father like that. Um, but she she would actually, because uh, she was so used to taking care of a man, you know, and she, you know, he had so the college just, degrees, the mason ring and all that good stuff. And She was know, all impressed. She was so impressed, yes. Do you think if she was in her right mind back today, she would still be impressed? Um, before she died, she told me what she really thought of him. Which was? She said, you take those kids and you take care of them. I said, why? She goes, well, you get away from him. He's a piece of shit. I said, you would talk about Danny like that? And that was on her deathbed. That was like two days before she died when she said that to me. Wow. And what amazed me, why she would even say that, I guess um, he when he went to the hospital to visit her and I was on my way back to Texas, He, my brother and his wife caught him making out with an, another girl in the car, the parking lot of the hospital. Oh, my God. So... Your parental figure, grandmother, who adopted you as your mother, she's dying. Danny goes to see her, and then he's making out with some other girl. My brother and his wife Claudia. with his kids caught him making out in the car in the in the parking lot of the uh, San Gabriel Valley Hospital. And he's teaching again in a California high school, accredited by the state of California teachers. Oh, well, you know how that is. See, when after we, we did, the, he got ran out of Florida, Trenton, Florida. We went to Las Vegas because that's where he wanted to go because he was addicted to gambling. He could not get a teaching job because of bad recommendations from Dr. Jack Klein from a Royal High School. And I believe there was a Mr. Grayson. He was a vice principal, and there were some other school board members. For a long time, we worked as security guards for five bucks an hour in Las Vegas. And he started going to Masonic meetings again. And then um, he, he, went, he came back all happy one evening. He said, hey, one of my buddies, Billy Jack, here knows this guy here who's a superintendent over there. And he just hired me. He didn't even do a background check. So Santa Ana, here we came. So Santa Ana School District failed to do a background check. And that person who should have done it, the superintendent, is probably a Mason. Right. That, exactly. That's, what, that's why he was so excited. Okay. Let me skip ahead. You come back from Germany because I want to get to Clive here. He's got some really important stuff. And I haven't really properly introduced Clive. You don't really know uh, the international scope that Clive Bustrand here on the show here has. So let me finish up here with Julie. You were back in Germany. You had a housekeeper taking care of your kids. You're getting reconstructive surgery on your jaw. Yes. You're recuperating, but you're still showing up for work kind of. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they steal your son and daughter, whose names are? Danny, uh, Danny James Witherspoon and Julie Ann Witherspoon II. They steal them right out of the school there? No, the hospital. Oh, out of the hospital. Why were they in the hospital? Well, we had all uh, had a, some kind of intestinal virus, and we were all, like, sick with the flu. So you're all in the hospital, yes. and they grab them out of the hospital. Yes. And ship them on a plane, bring them back here. 
You come back here, you get a judge that says, give her back her kids right now, and CPS says what? Right, well, yeah, Judge Fogel had, he was just following the law under the Hague uh, Treaty, and um, he made the ruling, and my uh, ex-spouse and his dirty Masonic attorney, um, I knew something was up when we left the courthouse, uh, the, the, the deal was to exchange the kids at the police station after the order was made, but instead he took my children to Orangewood Children's Home, another horrible place like the one I was in when I was a young kid, and um, he deposited my children in Orangewood Children's Home where they stayed for over a month till they went to the foster incarceration. Foster incarceration, good dialectic language there. Uh, you, you, you really re rewrote the, the meaning of the words. So you confront the CPS worker with your order from Judge Vogel saying, give her back her children. And the CPS worker says, tough, they're in the system, go away, I don't care. Right, her name was Maria Segovia. And she said, well, your husband said you're an alcoholic and a drug addict. You're not getting your kids. I said, I have a standing court order in my hand. You, you give me my kids now. She goes, oh, well, you're just going to have to take that up in the juvenile court. She says, you're not getting your kids and my brother was standing right there with me. Did you want to shoot her right then and there? Well, see, she didn't even come out and talk to me. It was by telephone. It oh. Was, yeah. It was, she wasn't taking a chance right. that she might shoot her right then and there. Because you're trained in military weapons, aren't you, Julie? Yes. Okay. Well, that brings us back to Clive. I have another gal who's going to talk about secret organization. We have her here by tape because I did an interview with her in 2002, when I really didn't really quite believe what she was telling me. I do now. I do now. And she's a former policewoman. Clive, you aren't just Clive Booster and a historical researcher. You were busy on international projects, weren't you? I've been involved in high tech uh, since the mid 80s. Uh, I've worked for most of the top tech companies, most of the top computer companies, most of the top telecommunication companies. I was building a very high-speed internet, a gigabyte per second connection anywhere in the world. This was 2001. We were able to deliver that. Uh, we were launching 91 satellites out of Russia. Uh, we were also given Space Station Mir by Russia. We were based here in the U.S. We had operations in Japan and England all around the world. You were given, you personally, were given the Mir space station before it fell out of orbit. My company. Infotelesis. Your company, which mm -hmm. was called? Infotelesis. Infotelesis. Mm -hmm. You were given the Mir space station, which must have been worth at least a billion dollars. They'd spent three and a half billion dollars on. Yeah. Three and a half billion dollars, and the Russian government, the new non-communist, just gave it to you. The Actually, the chairman of the Duma uh, wrote a, a letter granting Infotelesis that, and it went in front of the Duma. And um, what's interesting now, hindsight, of course, is 2020. You can understand a lot more when you know what's going on or what went on later on. Researching what, where the Russians are today, they're far ahead of the Americans in regard to understanding what this new world order, which is the opposite of Nuvus Order Seculum, this new world order, which is under the Universal Commercial Code, which goes straight back to the Vatican, this New World Order actually is intending to disrupt everything. Now, they put Russia through the communist era. They put Germany through Nazi area. This is all planned. Yes. Now they, they're doing it to America, aren't George they? Bush's granddad, Prescott Bush, actually couriered money And to, they're doing to it to America. America's next. We America's are going now. to be the new communist fascist regime, mm -hmm. and there will be no liberty or freedom here. And that's what Julie's fighting to get her kids get. And this is how you got interested. I, I'm actually under the same. Uh, Julie, I haven't been able to talk to my children for six months. Um, the, I've had three lawsuits I filed against the government. Um, the commissioner, primary defendant in Santa Cruz County, issued an order to evict me from my home the very day he had a hearing to try and have himself dismissed from the lawsuit I filed against him. Seems to be a conflict of interest there. Oh, it's, 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 a, it's a crime. It's, it's a criminal act by this commissioner, Erwin Joseph. At what Joseph. point, Cleve, do we ask our militias to pick up their rifles and march down to the courthouse? Well, if you ask that on TV, you're going to be arrested. Yeah, but I'm just asking. I'm not saying we do it. I'm saying at what point? 
I, I don't believe in violence. Um, I don't either. Well, but I mean, the only way things are going to change is a revolution. But Julie, when you have a see, I've been to a civil war, and and my great grandfather fought in a civil war, was wounded, and, and civil wars are real messy. That's a Hegelian dialect. Once it dialect. starts, that's a Hegelian dialect. Once you get into that conflict, and, and what peace. you got to understand is 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 that they want that. The first thing this new world order wants to accomplish is to get America completely messed up. Well, the only reason why they have it is because they have everybody's full cooperation. They have the people who work in our government, particularly the judiciary, the men wearing the black nighties and the women wearing the black nighties in our courts, mm -hmm. are the first ones who are guilty for not upholding the oath of office Do you to know, uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. I was in court last week, and I decided not to... Uh, to uh, paper off the commissioner and let go before the commissioner had been hailed in there. There was no party of real interest present. Yeah. That post board was not there. I pointed that out, said I'm here by special appearance under, until informed that this is a court of constitutional due process. And she had the temerity, the gall, to say we're here under the statutes of California <laughs> and we're here under this and that and under color of law. She said it out Admitted, of her own lips. Which is a crime. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> so she's basically saying, I'm, I'm like, a criminal. Title yeah, 42, she, no. USC 1414-1. No. Now, that also means a bailiff is also yeah. a criminal because a bailiff That's needs to go arrest her immediately. That's misprison of felony. Yeah, bailiff, right, right, right. Yeah, bailiff, right. Right. <laughs> bailiff Clark is yeah. now a criminal. A criminal as well. And I looked at the audience. There was like 40 people behind me. I looked at them to see if any of them understood what Commissioner Colleen Stern had just said. Out of her own lips, she said, under color of law. That's now, exactly how do you plead? Guilty or not guilty or no? That's concept. the trick. That's, That's the, the trick. trick. No one reads the Constitution. Now, the Fifth Amendment, let me just read this quickly because read it's it. worth it. Read it. The Fifth Amendment, no person shall be Zoom held. On him. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on the presentment or indictment of a grand jury. Now, what does that mean? That means that the government can't prosecute you without getting a grand jury indictment or presentment. And most people in America don't even know what a grand jury indictment or presentment is. That means the government has to go and get 24 people out of their community, and at least 12 of them have to agree and say that we reckon a crime occurred. Because without a grand jury indictment, the government cannot prosecute you. So what they do is they pull you into their little scam courts in a criminal act of fraud and treason, and they say, how do you plea? And when the person says, I'm not guilty, they say, ha, ah, good, you agreed to be prosecuted, didn't you? Let's go ahead and, and have our merry little prosecution, and we'll get the state to pay me my big fat salary and pension scheme. And it's one of the worst acts of treason, and it's so damn blatant, it's ridiculous. You cannot be prosecuted without a grand jury indictment. And wake up, America, wake up. It's time you read this damn document because this is the highest level law of the country. And every damn judge in that courtroom who wears that little black nighty goes and takes an oath to uphold this constitution. And when they violate that oath, they committed an act of treason, treason. And that act of treason, the sentence of which is death. We need to wake up America and we need to uphold this constitution and take our rights. What do you people on the audience think of that? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of people agree with you. They just didn't know that because they don't read the Constitution. They don't teach it in school. Because they go to state school. They you go to state school. You cannot go to state school. You cannot have the state educating you. By God, you're going to grow up thinking that Abraham Lincoln was honest. He's one of the most dishonest <laughs> presidents there was. He, is, yeah. he was so unpopular he, that he had to go in disguise into the office. Only president ever in history who was fearful of his life and he had to go and sneak into the back door of the White House. Well, I don't know about that. I think <laughs> Bush, Bush is fearful for his life. <laughs> and I'm sure Reagan was after he got shot. Reagan actually got shot. Or an interesting thing. Reagan was trying to get rid of the Federal Reserve Bank. I know. That's why he, he got shot. He, he, yes, I agree. He was shot because he was thinking about, we don't need the Federal Reserve, which is exactly what I've been saying. Look, they're talking about bailing out AIG. Why? Because the Congress and the U.S. Senators have their what? Their pension funds in AIG investments. So if they go under, your Congress critters, that's Boxer in California and Feinstein, lose a whole pile of money. It's gone. So they bail them out. 
if they really want to help the country, do what William Wagner said in my State of the Nation address. You bail out every American. You pay off everybody's car loan, everybody's home loan, everybody's credit card, every student loan, everybody's IRS taxes. You pay it all off with Federal Reserve notes because that's what they insisted we borrow in. That fractional reserve currency that ended up no reserve currency. You pay them all off. So the next day, we're all debt free. Then my plan was, and I, this is on my internet uh, channel uh, under William Wagner. I, it's up there. How to get out of the debt and solve our economic problems is you pay off every single debt. So we do that on Monday. Tuesday, you have America debt free. Houses paid for, cars paid for, anything anybody had a loan on, paid for. Then on Tuesday, we say to the Federal Reserve Banks, bye bye, you're out of here. And by the way, Communist China may want to have a chat with you as you leave our well, shores. We should, we, should, we should put our military into some good use in collecting the money that was raped well, by the Federal Reserve Bank. On, on Tuesday, That's we kick we the Federal do. Reserve out, but we confiscate all their gold and silver and all their property in the United States. No, internationally. They've been, they've been I don't think the United States can, can do that legally, internationally, no, but in our country I'm sure we, we will have wonderful assistance from <laughs> every other country in the world who would jump up and down and say, thank you, America, for waking up. Because we need to wake up. The Federal Reserve Bank is a private bank. It's a private Ponzi scheme. It's the biggest and, scam and ever. It is. They've scammed all our gold and silver. Not only that, they kidnapped our children. children. They caused all these wars. First, Second, Third World War. And, they and, throw us in jail under false charges and they steal everyone's homes. And now they're stealing their homes. And you people just keep voting for the scumbuckets. Well, let's talk about voting. Oh, no, who, who, okay, you were in the war. Now, right. who, who of the government and our mainstream media, who do they tell us our two worst enemies are? Saddam Hussein and... And Osama bin Laden. Uh, Hussein and Osama. Hussein and Osama. What's mm -hmm. the difference between Hussein and Osama and our president, Hussein Obama? Well... Nothing really. BS. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, it's o propaganda. BS. It's, it's O-S-A-M-A, O-B-A-M-A. <laughs> yeah. The only difference between Hussein Osama and Hussein Obama is BS. It's all <laughs> bullshit. It's all bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Little children, turn off your ears. Um, <laughs> Forgive me. We're a family, family show here. But, uh, well, we're not a family show. My kids, I can't even talk to my kids. See, you know, I have two, <laughs> yeah, I have my, two it's sons. It's my son's birthday. My it's kids his 13th are birthday on, on Saturday. And I can't even wish him two happy days, birthday. And, you can't even and I say couldn't happy wish birthday. my son ninth birthday, William. I couldn't wish him happy birthday That's last month. And I That's couldn't wish him happy Christmas. That's a Why? Because a, a commissioner who's a criminal issued an order to evict me from my home, order that I may not communicate with my children, and order that I may not submit any evidence in court. Well, I'm going to go with anything. you're going to court tomorrow, right? Yeah, we, I'm we, going to go with you. I'm going to document on videotape what goes down tomorrow. So you're going with some media tomorrow. Uh, I'll be with you. Well, we've actually had some media in there. I've had the largest TV channel in Europe come over. In fact, there's going to oh, be a Russian show. Oh, Russian sexy. Television. Russian TV. Has you know, that brings us up another thing. Uh, we've got these concentration camp, which I showed you and your Russian film crew. And they didn't like it because it was too small. And I thought about that after the Russians left. Mm -hmm. I thought a big, that big fenced area over in Vandenberg yeah. that you can see if you just take the train, go right through Vandenberg, and you look, there it is. Hello, what's that? Oh, it could be a concentration camp. What makes something a concentration camp? Well, that's quite a good what question. What makes a concentration well, now, you see, camp? What, what we're talking about is, is future concentration camps. 90% of the people in jail, prison, and on probation today have not been prosecuted with any due process. They haven't committed a crime under the law because under the law, the Constitution being the highest level law of the land, the underlying law is common law. There needs to be three elements present for every crime. The act, the intent, and the damage. Actus rea, uh, corpus delecti, and mens rea. Those elements must be present. 90% of the people in our jails, prison and probation, haven't committed a crime under the definition of common law. So they're there as political prisoners. And what are they made to do? Work. What do most of our prisoners do? They work. For have you seen the prison industry? Yeah. yeah, we point a finger at China and say, oh, you have slave labor. We have concentration camps in the United States of America today. We have more people in jail, prison, and on probation in the United States of America than every other damn country in the world combined. We're not worse than the worst. We're worse than all the worst 
combined. We're number today, one. Today, in the air, 2009, we are the worst country in the world. We are prison capital number one. We already have concentration camps all over, and they want to put a lot more of us in them. That's what we have to wake up about, America. We really have to look at what's going on. And we have to look at these judges, these sheriffs, and these CHP officers, and particularly our board of supervisors, and understand and ask them, you're in our community. What the hell are you doing? Follow the Constitution. Constitution's explicit. It's quite clear. You took an oath to follow it, so follow it. And we need to hold them up to their oaths of offices. When they go and prosecute someone without a grand jury indictment, we need to put together a grand jury, and it's real easy to do. If you go to libertyforlife.com, link on the Copper Cards link. And the Copper Cards site is an organization we put together to teach people the law. You yourselves can form a grand jury. Get randomly select 24 people from your community, present the evidence of the crime before those people, and then let them determine whether or not there's enough evidence to prosecute. A grand jury isn't finding someone guilty or not, but what they're determining is whether or not they, that person can be prosecuted. So form grand juries. When you have a sheriff stopping someone, when you have a CHP officer giving someone a ticket, now an infraction has no place in the law. It's not a crime. It's not a commercial act. An infraction was invented by the judiciary. And who do you make your check out to? The Superior Court. The guy is actually giving you the ticket. That officer has just committed an act of treason, a criminal act beyond any measure you can imagine, here in front of you, out in the open, with his little badge. Now we need to wake up, we need to understand what the law says, we need to bring back America back on the course that it was set by the founders. We need to bring back this nation where we the people are sovereign and no one is sovereign over us. We, need, we must have a country where there isn't any fiat currency like this Rothschild currency that's owned by the Federal Reserve Bank because you cannot have a private group owning the bank. Jefferson warned about that. Jefferson said that if you hand your money supply over to private individuals like we've done, the Federal Reserve Bank, you're going to wake up homeless on the continent your father's conquered. And he's absolutely right. There were there nine million foreclosure actions going on today in America. And those foreclosures are going on when the people borrowed money from the bank. Where did the bank get the money from? Thin air. Thin air. They invented out of stale air, actually. They made, they invented the money out of absolutely nothing. If the money you had to borrow to buy your house because they've created this market which goes out of control came out of nothing, you owe nothing. What you also have to understand is that that bank is directly responsible for your grandfather's and possibly your father's deaths if they served in any of these wars. You need to understand what's going on in Iraq. Mm. You know, they blame, they blame Saudi Arabia and so-called terrorists for blowing up the World Trade Center. And they ignored building number seven. Building number seven, that 47-story high building. The other side of building number five and six of the World Tra Trade Center complex. A block which didn't away. fall down. Yeah, across the away. street. It collapsed all by itself. With no plane hitting it. With what the FBI <laughs> and the CIA officers in it. With all the evidence of government corruption in them. Just collapsed out of, just boom, like it. They had the mayor's command center and there was reinforced to withstand 180 wow. mile an hour gale winds, withstand earthquakes, tornadoes, and the thing just whoop, came straight down. So we started, down. I'm starting a new website, uh, William. It's, it's called stupidrs.com. It's not up yet. Stupidrs.org. Uh, stupid <laughs> sorry, it's a .org. It's an organization. It's not for profit entirely, so don't send us any money. It's stupidrs.org. And we want to bring into the forefront some of these issues, like separation of church and state. That's a good idea. But by God, you can't let the state educate your kids. It's insane. Well, if they That's do. It's worse than having, you know, yeah. George Bush as your pastor. <laughs> <laughs> it's only one hour a week if the guy goes to church. If, if I'm going to have George Bush as my pastor, I might as well just ask Belzebub to come in and do it <laughs> firsthand and do it the way the devil wants it done because stumbling, <laughs> bumbling George probably couldn't get even the evil words right. <laughs> what about Hussein, Saddam Hussein? I mean, Hussein Osama. Forgive me, I'm getting my you words know, mixed Bush up. Bush is still president. Don't you know that, right? George W. Bush is still president because... Do we actually have a president? I'm well, not quite sure. No, even he's if still Osama president. Bush, he just slipped on a, he slipped on a thought, black skin. I thought the chairman of the Fed, Benaki, is our president, isn't he? 
chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank. He's in charge. No, actually, it, well, no, actually, well, Benarchy, the, the central the bankers, the 18 board of directors well, they're above of the him. central bankers they're above are above him. Benaki. They're absolutely up. There. And they're, they're really him. running things. So we're yeah. down to our last five minutes. I wanted to touch on something here, Clyde, because people don't really know. You were giving uh, international seminars on this banking gigabyte well, and the banking system. You set up the banking system that they're using now in many countries, right? Well, actually, I put together systems architecture for Intuit's Quicken product, the automated financial services behind the Quicken product. That's what um, I meant to I, say. I put that architecture together when I worked as a senior technical strategist for Sun Microsystems. But I've built banking systems, and in fact, I was building a next-generation banking system with Infotelesis as and well. And the, the Russian leader in the Duma gave you the... The Mir, which means peace, station. Well, actually, they gave station. us the space station. Mir is peace. And that was the spark which ended the Cold War incident. Right. They gave it to you because you intended to break it up into sections and geoposition it, right? We, we to have, have a worldwide modules, educational service where anywhere in the world they could go on a, a laptop yeah. computer and bring down the brightest professors from anywhere. Actually, the Pirata module we donated to, we were donating the Pirata module to education. That had tremendously advanced earth science monitoring gear on it. We were going to ed donate that to education. I'll get it Ed Project. In fact, you can go to the infotelesis.com site. It's the same the site as it was um, six years ago when I was shot at when they tried to murder it's, me in front of my kids. What site is called? Uh, Infotelesis. I-N-F-O. In T-E-L-E-S-Y-S dot -E -S com. But here's the point I want to get to. Had you succeeded in doing that, it would have brought education worldwide, globally, on an equal basis. Some kid with a $100 laptop could have downloaded from the satellite English language or any science he wanted to study and, and see the best professors. That's what you were attempting to I'll, do. I'll get it. Ed Project was actually exactly doing that. It didn't require Muir even, but Muir was one of the components, and we could still do that. We can still bring in tremendous. We can we can provide kids education in the United States of America at a fraction of the cost of what the government spends on education, which is vastly superior than anything else in the world. But they won't get brainwashed the way the government wants them to. Indeed, they won't. Bingo, and that's why I'm wondering if do you think possibly I don't want to get into the nasties, but your wife ran off with your personal assistant, basically. My personal assistant joined the, my company about two, three months after um, Space Station Muir. We were completely censored. Uh, Russian government gave us Space Station Muir. We had a letter from the chairman of the Duma. Complete support, no issues with respect to credibility. And they gave you some and launch we were completely vehicles. Censored. They were going to give you launch vehicles. They gave us 100 launch vehicles. They also gave us 1.74 gigahertz of international telecommunication spectrum, which is a huge amount of spectrum. Now, uh, is that totally understood. lost while you fight your custody battle? My point is, you're, you're fighting your custody battle, you're just trying to get your kids back, and you can't focus on this great thing that would do great things for the world. That's what I'm trying to say. The government is currently trying to lock me up for the rest of my life. They currently have Bingo. five felonies filed against me. They got five felonies against this guy. I'm out on $200,000 bail, ordered not to communicate with my children, and ordered not to go within 100 yards of my own home and homestead. By being evicted from my 5,000 square foot home overlooking Monterey Bay. Is this a crime by your government people? That's what I'm asking. Do you think there's somebody so evil in our government that they would do this? I want you to have second thoughts. Here's a guy right here in the studio with us who had a space station donated to him. I want to thank you, Clyde, for being with My us on, on the show Take Back America. All right. In the On Second Thoughts series, I'm William Wagner with my guest Julie Witherspoon, an Iraqi veteran, and also a veteran of fighting to just get her kids back, and hasn't yet, and Cleve, who's also a veteran. Hope you paid close attention, or my YouTube channel, William Wagner. And catch us here, same time, same station, next week. See ya. could have only been accomplished with at least the acquaintances and foreknowledge of the only man capable of choreographing the massive cover-up which was immediately launched. Huh. It's axiomatic that since the cover-up started even before the shots were fired, the order for JFK's assassination could have only come from his successor, Lyndon B. 
Johnson. Oh, my goodness. Patterns, we're talking about patterns today. And this pattern that we had in the past has followed us to now. And I'm Pamela Wistrom. Thanks for being with us tonight. And come back soon. Real soon. Bye.